Hey, Paul. Welcome to today's episode. I'm so glad to have you. I did never expected I would be having this conversation. And to get everyone started off, I know who you are, or I know a little bit of who you are, but I'm hoping that we are going to go on this journey together. You are a global citizen, which I love, and it, unpacking that's going to be interesting. You are a ex Fin- a financial banker, I would say, global banker, and you've been you've lived all over the world. You are also um, in charities. You are very involved with the Face Equality charity as well, which is amazing. And what else? I mean, there's so much to you, and you're also focusing on DEI. And so, I want to unpack all of it within the next forty five minutes, and I hope you're up for that as well. Absolutely. So. My beginning is, I love when we spoke, you said, act of courage and of being heard. I want to ask you, what is that? I mean, for me, an act of courage is, it's about sort of challenging yourself um, in the context of a negative experience or, or a memory that doesn't feel you, know, feel you necessarily with, um, with happiness. And sharing that and talking about that as, as a mechanism to help your own kind of recovery, but also potentially help others that may be going on a similar journey to you and um, maybe feeling sort of somewhat alone. Um, let them know that they're not alone and someone else has had a similar experience and survived. And that not just survived, thrived as a consequence of the experience. I like that you're saying the word thrive. And here is where I'm going to ask you. You've had more than one act of courage. But we're going to talk about the biggest act of courage, I would say, which is what? That's really asking my parents about how they felt when I was born with one ear. Um, One ear. One ear, yeah. So I have a condition called microtia atresia, which is Greek for little ear. It affects um, boys more than girls, and it affects the right ear more than the left ear. So I'm missing my right ear. Um, I was born with this little flap of skin at the bottom. This is cartilage from my rib cage. Um, and when my parents, uh, when I was first born, my, I was immediately taken away from my mother um, because they spotted there was something wrong with me. Um, and um, one of the acts of courage for me um, in, gosh, 15, 16 years ago was to ask my parents, whilst I still could, because both of my parents were alive at that point, my father is no longer with us, how they felt when I was born and their firstborn wasn't perfect. I didn't have two ears. Um, And that that took a lot of courage on my part to ask the question because I knew how upsetting it would be um, um, as a question for them to kind of answer. But it was such an important conversation for me to have with them. And I'm, I'm so pleased I found the courage to do so whilst I could. May I ask, what was the most surprising point, I would say, or the most vulnerable moment having that conversation or that moment of like completion? That's the right word I'm looking for, the completion moment. I think it wasn't necessarily about that conversation it then became kind of bigger picture and almost a bit like a jigsaw puzzle and, and the pieces kind of making sense when putting into the puzzle together. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, when I uh, came out to my parents as gay, um, the conversation I had with them then was um, in the context of my ear, but equally the Catholic Church, um, yeah. and me being nervous because my parents were um, very involved in the Catholic Church and um, being gay was supposed to be a sin in the eyes of the Catholic Church and how would they feel about me in the context of, of, of my coming out as gay and the response I got from, from my parents was, well no we've been through too much with you um, oh. because of the experiences they had with me and the surgery I had to have as a child because Mm -hmm. of my ear. And that, I think, made the relationship more robust, uh, more important, because they'd been through so much with me 
Um, so I think for me it was it was it was the combination of all of those events um, and thinking about them as a bit of a jigsaw puzzle. I'm the jigsaw puzzle complete. Yeah, you feel bits. like you have all these bits and pieces. Yes, yes. And you were tr trying to bring it all together, and the starting point was your parents, I guess. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, yeah, they were such an important part of, of my life. Yeah, they still are. But whether that's different because of what they went through with me, because of my ear and the stress and the trauma of that for them is probably on a par with the trauma that I felt with my ear as a child, um, but just just from a different through a different lens. And I and I felt it was important to have the conversation with them about how they felt, um, and then sharing how I felt. Uh, and yeah, both of, both of those elements were acts of courage. Yeah, they were. Them and then sharing with them. Um, yeah. But so, so important to do that. And you had these conversations separately or at the same time? At the same time, actually over the phone, um, because I was living in Singapore at the time um, and um, was on the phone and it was a conversation I planned so I'd been getting kind of somewhat sort of stressed about it in the lead up to the, the call and asking the question because I was planning it. And so I, I guess I took my mum by surprise. My mum sort of got quite emotional about it in terms of upset, not, not in a negative way, but I guess it was, it was bringing up some of those memories yeah. um, for her, which is why I, I found it quite nerve-wracking and stressful because I didn't want to upset her. But at the same time, it was so important for me to kind of ask the question and understand how they felt. There's so much to unpack just by in that sentence. I mean, you're in Singapore. Your partner's from Singapore. Yes. And then there is, so there's cultural differences. But also in, in Asia, correct me if I'm wrong, but gay community or the LBGTQ plus community has always been like a very awkward conversation culturally. I don't know if that's the same in Singapore as well. And then there is cultural difference like in having with religion being involved also and that also. And then plus there is overworking this idea, this, this not idea, but you were born with already feeling something is different with me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just to be clear, the comp when I came out to my parents, I was living in the UK. Oh, you were living in the UK, okay. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that conversation had happened a long, long time ago. Okay. Um, and I would say that was 1997, so a very, very long time ago. Um, the, the, the conversation about my ear and asking those questions, um, that, that act of courage and being brave around that, that happened in 2009. So a long time afterwards. Um, but I think there was also... There was a clock that was starting to tick for me in terms of the reality for, for most of us that um, our, our parents um, will die before us um, and wanting to, be, to have that conversation before it was too late to have the conversation. Yeah, I hear that. I can, I understand that. But you've been, I'm, I can't even imagine putting myself remotely in your shoes because that's a lot. It's almost like... E you had to keep living a double life in a certain way. Like you can never be your true self or am I, or were you able to live your true self always? Or were all these little, little, they're not little. I mean, all these little moments and I call them little, but that's not the right word, but all these moments collectively, yeah. you're constantly having to, you know. Yeah, I, I could go back even further then because, um, Back in 1991, um, I went traveling around the world. Um, I was a backpacker for 18 months. Oh wow! And, okay. And two of the um, two of the kind of the key milestones for me around the travel, or two of the kind of the the goals I set for myself. That's probably the better way of framing it. One to deal with my sexuality, mm -hmm. and two to deal with my ear. Not necessarily in that order. Whilst I was living in Sydney, um, I did uh, my first act of courage 
which was to have my hair cut short above my ear for the first time. Because when I was a child and was a teenager, mm-hmm. my hairstyle was kind of, my hair was down here. So all you could see at the bottom of my ears, I tell you, on, on, on my right ear, I had the, 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 the bottom. I can remember going to the hairdressers in Sydney and having an argument with myself in my head in terms of, you don't need to, to cut your hair above your ear. It's fine as it is. Or, come on, Paul, you're 23 or 22. You can do this. It's not a big deal. You can have your hair cut. Um, and then going, being in the hairdressers and the typical kind of hairdresser conversation about, oh, what are your plans for the weekend? And and you, you, this hairdresser's having this kind of really inane conversation with me. And, but in my head, I'm kind of almost kind of shouting and thinking, do you not realise how big a deal this is? I'm having my hair cut short for the first time in my life. I'm putting my ear on this leg. Having paid the, the haircut, coming out of the hairdressers, and being stood at these traffic lights in North Sydney, waiting to cross the road, and I'm literally looking at everybody to see if anyone is staring at me or looking at my ear mm-hmm. and giving me a wide berth, and nobody was. So that was quite... Um, you know, enlightening and, and refreshing and gave me more courage as well. Um, and then kind of getting home and a couple of the girls that I lived with at the time, you know, hugging me and saying, you know, how brave I'd been. But that yeah. was one of my first acts of courage was to kind of have my hair cut short and put my ear on display, which I'd never done before. So that was a major thing for me. Um, so that was 19, that would have been early 1992 when I was living in Sydney. The second one in terms of my, my sexuality was um, I didn't actually manage to achieve that whilst I was travelling. I got back to the UK December 1992 and then was almost kind of angry with myself that I hadn't achieved that second goal. Um, so in, in some regards I, I viewed that as a fail. And then, but that was then the impetus for me in early 1993 to, to get on with it and deal with it, and, you know, come out as gay. So they were, they were the two events that, that were my, my, my acts of courage before I knew the term act of courage, where I challenged myself to deal with my ear and then uh, my sexuality. After that, uh, I then had, in 1994, I had surgery on my ear, um, and this is the first and only surgery that I chose and I elected to have, where they drilled through my skull to make me an ear canal, and that gave me 30% hearing on my right side for a period of time. Uh, Since then, the hole has closed up, and I've gone back to being profoundly deaf on on my right side. But one of the conversations that will stay with me um, until I die was when I phoned my mum having come out of the doctor's surgery or clinic rather mm. where they would taken all of the bandages off and they they had done the hearing tests and confirmed I, I could hear and I came out of the, the clinic and I called my mum and I said mum I can hear and even even today that gives me goosebumps but being able to say that um, and then when my mum then saw my ear, um, she then, I remember her saying to me, gosh, Paul, it looks like an ear. We were always disappointed with the way that your ear looked as a child after the surgery. But we could never say that to you because we didn't want you to, to know that we'd felt somewhat disappointed. So all of these kind of conversations are um, have had an impact on me, I would say, in a, in a, in a hugely positive way, um, because it's given me the strength and the impetus and the drive to push through and succeed where my parents were told I never would. Um, for example, my, my parents yeah. were told that I would never be academically successful because I would miss too much in the classroom because I couldn't hit. But talking about that, uh, to debunk that, you are... A- a banker and you have done you've been in one of the top banks in the world and you ended up in Singapore this is not and you're an MD yes right Um, a lot of people would say that's not possible you know we always frown upon corporates and how it 
how it, you know, doesn't, it's not so accessible. But you made an act of courage right there as well. How did that happen? Um, I, I, mean, I think um, my experiences sort of translated into a, a kind of a drive um, to succeed and be the best person I could be in so many kind of different ways. So I think that when I made MD at a, a US investment bank in my mid to late 30s, which is, yeah, it was a huge achievement. Um, and and that, that was before the, the bigger focus on uh, DNI. Yeah, um, there was none, practically none, right? Exactly, exactly. So that was, um, that, that success, that achievement was born of determination and, and working really hard. And I, I'm a great believer in you make your own luck. Now, you've got, you've got to have lady luck on your side in the first place in terms of a number of different variables. But then taking your, your kind of your starting point as, as a springboard and thinking about, okay, how do I take this up, up a notch or up a number of notches? Mm -hmm. um, for me, that, that was part of my kind of drive and focus was to, to have that kind of success. Um, I mean, one of my role models was my, my mum's father, my grandfather. Uh, and the reason why he was a role model is when I was first born, he offered to give up his right ear so that I could have two. And I wouldn't deal with the, the negativity of being bullied at school or other challenges that might come from only having one wow. ear. Now, back then, the surgery wasn't sufficiently sophisticated for that offer to be sort of translated into reality. My grandfather was a, a hugely successful um, individual from a career perspective. And I think all of those aspects of him and what he'd offered to do for me made him an important role model for me. Beautifully generous, I would say. Yeah. And that generosity or the act of generosity in itself is an act of courage as well. In yes. those days, I would say. Yes, yes, um, yes. Absolutely. That's really impactful. And so you've, you've always, you've never, it's almost like you don't, you've taken every issue in your life that has come and you've met it with a sense of overcoming. Was it always yes. like that? I would say it has been. I mean, sometimes people say to me, gosh, it must be exhausting. And maybe at a level it is. But uh, for me, the effort it is so, so worth it because the reward is so satisfying. Effort equals reward. So you've, you've got to be able to put in that effort if you want to see the, the rewards. And that's kind of the way I've always kind of lived my life. I don't expect anything, but I'm, I'm willing to work hard for it. Did you do this since childhood or was there a moment where you said, not this, not anymore, and then you changed it? I, I would say I, I did it, I've done it since childhood. I mean, I would say that, that as a child, I was probably impressed by, by things that perhaps were not the right things to be impressed by. So, for example, when friends of my parents got a brand new Jaguar car, that impressed me. But then it was about understanding, well, how did they get that? And then understanding, okay, well, that's through working hard and you know, putting a focus on sort of vacation, on career, that, that you will then see those kind of rewards. So, you know, as a child, that was probably part of my thinking. Like my, my first word when I was a child was car. So I've always been a bit of a petrol head. So that kind of impressed me. You've got to personalize it. You've got to make it relevant to you. Talking about making it relevant to you, did you ever meet other individuals that have struggled with what you had? Yeah, I mean, the first time I met somebody with the same ear as me, I was in my um, early 20s. 20s? Um, Yes, I was on, on business in New York and it was in the hotel gym and it was one of the trainers that worked in the gym and I can remember being in the, in the, in the gym using the equipment and spotting this, this chap with the same ear as me and wondering well, how on earth do I start a conversation with him 
it seems a bit kind of naff to go up to him and say, oh, I've got the same ear as you. Um, but we did get into a conversation. And it was, it was so kind of, uh, it was such a meaningful event for me. And just hearing some of his experiences um, around his ear. And equally, since then, other conversations I've had with people with a similar condition, how they feel about it. Some people don't want to use their microtia uh, in any shape or form. They just want to get on with their lives and um, it has no bearing on who they are as, as individuals. And then you've got others, that there's, a, there's, there's a whole kind of dichotomy of people that have a different kind of experience with their ear or their disability and want to leverage or use it in different ways. And there's no right or wrong way. It's what's right for you um, as an individual. I mean, I've had parents of children come up to me at Heathrow Airport, the x-ray machines, and say to me, I hope you don't mind me asking, but my son's got the same ear as you and what was your experience? And this is a parent that's concerned about the journey their child's going to go on and will they have the potential to be academically um, successful and, and have a career and be able to contribute to society. So taking 10 minutes out of my day, stood at my side of an x-ray machine at Heathrow Airport to talk to this dad about my experience yeah. and clearly helped him. Mm-hmm. He was very grateful for me taking the time. And equally, he put a spring in my step. You know, I kind of boarded that plane to wherever I was going, feel as though, you know, I'd done my good deed for the day. More than that, can I ask you one question? The parent is worried about the child. Your parents are worried about you. Have you experienced it? The facial, the biasness around the facial, the look of it. Have you faced it? Yes, I have. I mean, I can remember on the the school bus, uh, some of the kids on the bus getting, getting me in a headlock and then uncovering my 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 ear because I had my I said earlier I had my, my hair longer and then just touching it and, and you know you look at that that's horrible you're deformed um, and and that whole experience um, and then trying to kind of hide myself on that school bus or put myself in a position where I couldn't got into another headlock when I got home. My mum knowing something had happened because you could just tell from my demeanour. They've been somewhat mortified when my mother insisted on going up to the school to speak to the headmaster. You know, the individuals that had actually done that then being hauled in front of the headmaster and made to apologise to me. And I felt embarrassed about that. Yeah. My, my mother was determined that she was going to defend me and protect me. And, you know, she did the right thing, but it was, yeah, that wasn't a fun experience. It, it's not helped me back. You know, I found a way to leverage that experience, uh, make something of myself. Well, that comes to another question that just popped in my head. Going into meetings, because you said one side, you now don't have the hearing again. So it's gone back to where the hole is closed. So in meetings, do you have to sit strategically in a certain area as well? I mean, how does it work? Absolutely, always. And it's the same in restaurants as well. I, I hate round tables because there's always going to be somebody on my right. And I always tend to have to start the conversation by almost apologising and saying, look, I'm not ignoring you. I just can't hear you. So if you start to talk to me and you're not getting a response, please just tap me on the arm and then I can join the conversation. I, you know, that's just part and parcel of who I am and what I need to do. It is what it is. It's no big deal. And I'd rather say that up front rather than get to the end of a meal and someone kind of think, oh, that guy on my left, yeah, he was so rude, he didn't talk to me at all. Um, I tried talking to him and he ignored me. So for me, it's like, no, 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 no. It, it, that's, I, I don't want them thinking that of me. Yeah. And therefore, I'm going to own this and I'm going to start the meal uh, or the meeting by saying this to them so that the we both are going to enjoy the experience. And have you ever found yourself in the word in a pickle? Sorry, Have you ever found yourself in a pickle? 
sometimes, um, uh, I mean, on occasions where I'd misheard somebody, mm -hmm. uh, years ago it would be that uh, I would say pardon or excuse me once, they would try to repeat themselves. If after the second time I still hadn't heard it, I'd ask one more time, and after that I would just then pretend I'd heard it because it was getting, I was starting to get embarrassed, and yeah. I thought they're going to find it a bit frustrating. And on one occasion, I thought I'd, I'd said what they, I'd understood what they said, so I just laughed, um, to which they responded, well, I don't really think that was very funny, um, because they were telling me something that wasn't funny, and I just not heard them. Yeah, I, I then kind of learned that it's, it's better not to try and second guess and pretend you've heard somebody to can backfire. Yeah. So what do you, so I know you were on the board of the charity, of the face equality. Yeah. What is the beauty that they do there? I mean, it'd be really nice to get, our, you know, people who are listening in to at least also go and check it out and, you know, support because it is something important. Uh, absolutely. And you know, it's, a lot of the focus is around raising, about raising awareness uh, of facial disfigurement and making sure that people have the right level of protection you know, legally, whether that's in, in the UK or other geographies around the world. What we do at Face Equality is every year we have Face Equality Week, and that's coming up um, in May. And, and this year's theme is My Face is a Masterpiece. Um, oh, I like that. My face is a masterpiece. Yeah. Mm. And if you have a look at the website, you'll yeah. see there's some commentary around that and equally posts on LinkedIn as well. So we're, we're really trying to raise profile. The charity I've been involved in now for uh, four years. Initially, I, I, I started as an ambassador for them um, or an advisor to the board, and then, then I joined the board. Um, and I've also done some work with the uh, with a related company called Changing Faces. Um, Changing Faces. And they do this, they're the similar organisations? Yes, yes okay. they're similar. So both organisations were founded by the same chap, a chap called James Partridge. James was in a car crash when he was a university student and the car he was in rolled and the petrol tank um, blew up. So he suffered burns. Um, so he he ended up with facial disfigurement as a consequence of an accident. And what you've got to keep in mind when you think about people's journeys in relation to any form of disability is, was it from birth? So, for example, myself, it was a congenital, congenital birth defect. Was it through illness, a mm -hmm. cancer, for example? Or was yeah. it through accident, so, which is James' experience? Um, because it, the starting point has an impact on the journey, the experience, and how people are, are feeling. And equally, it's not just about the individual, it's also about the family members around them as well. So whether that's siblings or parents, it's important to kind of keep in mind the, the impact an individual's disfigurement or disability has on, on the broader family. And how do you now take this into the corporate area? Because you work with professionals as well. Yeah, I mean, I, a lot of it's about just sharing my experience as well. So conversations like this, um, I, I'll have these kind of conversations in a work setting. I, I've done it with law firms where they've invited me to be part of their you know, their kind of disability forum, where I talk about the experiences I've had. And, and sharing it, it is educating. It raises awareness and it makes people stop and think. And for me... That, that's so, so important and because I'm helping others by sharing my own experiences. And equally, even today, I'm still helping myself. So this conversation will help me as well uh, and hopefully will help lots of other people. I hope it does as well. Can I ask you one question? You mentioned a word and sometimes I hear that there's a, you know, certain words always have this, puts up the barriers, you know, or it, it makes it the word disability. What do you think about it? I don't like the first three letters. Mm -hmm. I like the rest of the word that starts with the letter A. Ability. ability, of course. So when I write disability, I always capitalize the A. Is there, like, I prefer to use physically limited. Is that, is that better or is that the same or is that worse? Um, 
whatever works for you, I, I think. And I, I think being aware of the impact of how you describe someone or something mm -hmm. is, is, is more important. And checking in. So asking that person, is it okay if I say this? And mm -hmm. how do you feel about that? That, that for me, demonstrates um, care. So it's almost like it's there's something I call the power of inquiry. Yes. Asking before you asking before you just step in and make all these assumptions here around it. Uh, absolutely. That expression reminds me of a term that I've often used in relation, not just to my ear, but any form of visible difference or invisible difference, which is nothing about me without me. Nothing without say that nothing again? about me nothing without me. So don't have a conversation about me without including me in the conversation. I really like that. Nothing mm -hmm. about me without me. I'm gonna try and I have to make a quote this and send it to you because this is your quote. <laughs> it is I, it no, it is so it really captures that whole idea, the whole thing about just get over it. Don't 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 take things for granted. Yeah, and don't make assumptions. And don't make assumptions. Yeah. So come come with that sense of inquiry. It is yes. it is all that. Yes. Oh, I like that. I really really do. So and when you do this, so when you do speak in dif different forums, surely they must have that 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 feeling of can I use this word? Not use this word. How do you bring it into the conversation? Do you have you ever had to talk about it in a conversation? Um, I, I've never found myself in a situation where I needed to correct language that's being used. People have always been appropriate with me uh, in terms of these kind of conversations. And to give a little bit of context there, I've only really been having these conversations about my ear for the last 15, 16 years. So, so you know, in terms of my own journey, it took me a while before I was comfortable to openly talk about my ear and my, my experiences with my ear. So, you know, and I think in that last 15, 16 years, there's been more awareness of uh, an appropriate way to engage with people that are sharing these kind of experiences. I've been fortunate in that um, the, the time frame in which I've been able and willing uh, and had the opportunity to, to talk about my experiences, people have been engaging in a way that's appropriate and helpful. I, I, re I really like this whole openness now about having conversations. And not having conversations that are right, but having conversations that make a person say, okay, I really don't know this, you know, yeah. opening up the ground for it. That leads me to one question. How about your romance? May I ask, how did you go through your experience connecting with your relationships in the romantic area? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, when I was you know, dating, there was always a question for me around, okay, when is the right time to bring up my ear? And is it the first date, second date, third date? Do I come across as too intense because I bring it up on the first date? Or am I showing or demonstrating a lack of really being interested because I didn't bring it up to the third date and, and the elephant in the room has not been addressed. So it was always a difficult one for me in terms of trying to, like, trying to get it right in terms of when do I say something versus when don't I say something. Going on the journey of trying to kind of chat someone up, I would always start by positioning myself so that my, my good ear, I, where I can hear, was the one they could see. And that wasn't just because I wanted them just to see my good ear, but it was also because I, I needed to hear them. Yeah. <laughs> I had to have my good ear facing their, their mouth so I could actually hear what they were saying. So there was always that dilemma 
of when do I bring up my ear? And by bringing it up, am I making a bigger deal of it than it needs to be? So it was always that that kind of challenge. And sometimes I got it right and sometimes I got it wrong. Um, so, so do you get to be naughty with certain words? Like, um, you know, my, you know, I have a friend, he goes, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Well, I get accused of having selective hearing. <laughs> um, so when it suits me, I can hear. When it doesn't, I, I don't. I mean, I kind of, I jokingly say, I, you know, I sleep the sleep of the dead because when I go to bed, I just lie on my good ear and I can't hear anything else. So, you know, the whole house could collapse around me and I'd still be fast asleep. So you've just given a new meaning to selective hearing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, it, well, it's true, and sometimes I do, but um, no, I, I'm not kind of consciously aware of it. I, I've never knowingly pretended not to hear something. You know what I like from from our conversation is that you enjoy being you with whatever it is. You know, whatever it is, it's like okay, it's a condition, but it's not me. And you know, you've you've just gone every step. You just seize it and go. Let's just do it. Let's take the positive out of it. I really, from a human perspective, I feel sometimes we need to hear these stories more. Just make the most of whatever it is in front of you. Yeah. And you've definitely, you stand, you stand as that presentation to me, like, you know, this is who I am. You don't over grandize it. If that's, you know what I'm, does that make, you don't make yourself the hero, like, you know, this is so big. It's a hero. You just say, embrace it in your life. Get on with it. Exactly. I have not allowed it to hold me back either. I, you know, I could have taken a, oh, woe is me, um, everything's against me, give up before I even started. What a waste that would be. Now, um, everyone's different and everyone goes on their own journey. But for me, in terms of my own journey, I wanted to find the way to use my, my ear and my experiences with my ear overlaid with them coming out as a gay man um, to move myself forward in a way that helps me and hopefully helps others as well. You know, Paul, I know we're nearing the end of the interview, but I just want to keep talking to you because there's so many questions that are rushing to me. And, and I know your time is precious. That I got you. I was like, yes. But I have one more question. Now we're moving into tech, right? How much work can be done to support in this area with all these different conditions? Because it's not just in face equality. It's not just air. There is so much more to this as well. And with AI coming in, reading facial expressions, all this is just so unpacking. How does that affect the facials, like facial recognitions or um, hearing? Is there so much work? Is there more work to be done? Because there's, there's definitely more to be done. And if, if you think now at some airports that are now using facial recognition to allow you in mm -hmm. uh, to the country, less of an impact on me personally because it's not my eyes, ear and mouth. But yeah. facial disfigurement, that covers the whole face. Yeah. So does that technology have the ability to recognise something that is, I hate to say this, out of the norm in terms of the standard two eyes, two ears, a nose and a mouth, yeah. to allow somebody to enjoy that same seamless experience of travelling through an airport. And I, and I get the whole 80-20 logic that you kind of get it, trying to get it right for, for the 80%, but don't forget the 20%. Take them on the journey as well. I 100% with you. I heard about the 80-20% the other day because I was asking someone how do they travel. They live. They are now on a wheelchair. They've been on a wheelchair um, after an accident. And so for, I think, 20 years, she's been on this wheelchair. And so I asked her about traveling. She said, and I said, the bathrooms are too tiny. You know, I'm like, how? And then she explained to me about the 80-20%. And then the consequences to me was quite... It was heartbreaking that somebody has to suffer physically, you know, be discomfort because of this 80% rule. Yeah. Just what else can be done about it? 
Yeah, but I, and I, I think, again, it comes down to trying to find the positive or finding an angle that yeah. drives engagement. So you've got to try and, and frame it in the right way, I think, to get the engagement. So it's all about the words you use as well and then the way you kind of communicate. Uh, and it's also acknowledging and recognising that, that you do need something different. That's not, that's not a negative. That's the whole reasonable adjustment that is defined under law in terms of people's rights with disability, whether that's in an office environment or, uh, or otherwise. It's making sure that they are given the infrastructure they need to be as successful as the next individual. And, and I think successful should also translate into enjoyable. So your yes. ability to enjoy yep. um, should not be negatively impacted because you're in a wheelchair or you've only got one ear or you, you struggle to, to hear or, or see or you've got some kind of it, some invisible difference. Mm -hmm. We all deserve equality. It goes back to the word you said in the beginning, which is thrive. Yes. You know, it's not about surviving anymore. It's about thriving. And I, I agree because we're mm -hmm. we're in our headspace of only like just survive, tick. And I'm just thinking, but then what's, do you, I ever, I ask myself personally, well, how would I want to be on my last day of my life? Will I ever look back and saying, I just live to survive or did I enjoy it? Did I thrive? And I think that is any human being, any human being should have that allowance to ask that question. Yes, but, but and I think equally from the outside looking in, so when you're looking at another individual, if, they, if they've made the decision that they are happy mm -hmm. surviving, then good for them. Okay. It's for them to make that call. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I say that because I can remember when I worked at one of the big global banks in Singapore, being at a roundtable discussion, around um, disability and there was a chap there that was just grateful that he got a job and was able to provide for his family and put food on the table and he didn't necessarily want a career he was happy with the job he was happy with being able to survive mm -hmm. um, and to provide for his family he wasn't necessarily looking to be the next ceo of the bank he was was happy that he got to a level where it allowed him to provide. But then, Paul, is that then surviving, if not thriving, his definition of thriving? I guess so, yes. Is yes. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where it becomes very personal. It's down to the individual. Yeah. It sounds like it to me because he sounds like he had chosen for his quality of Happiness is through his family. That's his number one value and, yeah. and happiness factor, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I agree with you. Not everybody wants to be a CEO. Not everybody has to be that CEO or the leader. There's some yeah. people who are just content where they are. But then I don't see that as survival. I see that as thriving, you know. Yeah, yeah true. Yeah. true. I agree with you. But thank you for coming on my podcast. Well, thank and you very much. I look forward. I'm going to share all the details of face equality and for them to, um, to find out more information and support as well. Brilliant. But thank you for expanding my mind and helping me explore language, exploring seeing what I may not have considered as well. I really appreciate it. Really. Thank you. Very for thank you very much indeed. Speak to you soon.